Welcome to Cars on Call. I'm automotive journalist Steve Schutz. I'm here with trauma surgeon Stefan Moran and uh, automotive collector, connoisseur, consultant Adams. And before we get to Adams, Stefan, you had a near-death flu experience. Now you're like healthy. Well, you know, I've got this still a bit of brain fog, so pardon me today, but I saw a nurse friend of mine who works at a big uh, level one trauma center, and they are calling it fluvid. And um, they said, she said they're getting patients that are coming in with influenza A and COVID or patients that have COVID or patients that have just influenza A. All the patients complain of the exact same thing. Which so, is? Which is like, you think your brain is under so much pressure, it's going to ooze out of your ears and your eyes. You have a horrible cough and then fever and just chills and malaise and you feel like you're going to die. And so they're calling it fluvid up there and uh, i i only tested positive for influenza but i i still according to my wife have a lot of brain fog <laughs> yeah you you had that uh the exact same thing before you got the flu anyway <laughs> yeah. um <laughs> let's adam, adam good to see you too and i'm glad we're all healthy uh let's run through the 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 outline for today because it's really fun uh, a lot of bases to cover so we don't want to waste too much time but we've talked about subscriptions for mundane features in a car and BMW came out with that idea about uh, nine months ago and they were beaten about the head and neck with a baseball bat by everybody and they dropped the idea well Audi's coming back with it we'll talk about that a notable death very sad Adams you're going to talk about a great designer who died Stefan's going to talk about trauma surgeon safety we are the only podcast or YouTube show that has a trauma surgeon who has done research in car accidents and car crashes and has operated on countless patients who have had car accidents or car crashes. Dr. Stefan Morant, we're the only one that has that. So he's here to talk about uh, trauma surgeon safety. And Adams, your knowledge of collector cars is amazing. So we're going to, we're going to get on actually you had a car spotty, which is not a collector car. <laughs> it probably won't make the, uh, the top heap of design, um, designs over any era but uh it was an interesting car i, I had the forgettable car all right it's very i think it's very forgettable the uh, i had the opportunity to see one of the best porsche collections in the world the ingroom collection i'll talk briefly about that then we're going to talk interiors we talked a little bit last time stefan about interiors and how they're safe and unsafe we're going to get into that distracted driving and how the interiors uh can either help or hurt with that and finally we're each going to pick our favorite interiors so uh, without further ado, let's get into it. And Stefano, you're going to launch on this, but according to Audi, in Europe, the Audi A3, I think it's notable, let's see, A3, it's their lowest level car. They're going to require buyers to pay a subscription fee by the month for, and let me list the features, and I, I, I guarantee you this list is going to expand. Adaptive cruise control, automotive headlights, automotive, um, I'm sorry, automatic high beams, Apple Play or Android Auto, dual climate zone control. Seriously? Dual climate? I mean, forget about the quad because you have one in the back too. Go ahead and launch, Stefan. This is a bad idea. Well, you know, BMW came out with the, they're going to put electric seats in every vehicle because it's cheaper for manufacturing. And then you're going to have to pay a subscription for your seats to work that are already in your, the electric seats, they're already in your car. And BMW just got, I mean, hammered yeah. in the press i mean it was then they, they pulled back and said we're not doing it you know why does audi think they can get away with this um i know that the automotive manufacturers are going to keep pushing for this pushing for this but wait a minute you got to subscribe to use carplay in your car yeah i just forget that i mean i can tell you right now that people are just going to turn around and walk out of a dealership I mean, you know, where we've talked about us on the show, nobody likes going to a car dealer. We all feel like we get screwed. You know, Jeff Bank told us, we, we had an email going around. He had to pay $500 for the sanitization of his, the interior of Miata when he bought it. And then they put the coating on this and the coating at that. And, no, oh, we already put it on there. We won't take it off. I had the experience with the bullet where they said it had an anti-theft device in it for $1,500. They couldn't take it out. My car didn't even have it in there. And it took me months to get the money back. So people don't like car dealers. I'm surprised typically. that you that when you didn't find it, that they also were going to charge you for not putting it in there. 
<laughs> so I this mean, is you know, just... sanitization is like they they open the door they they do pss, pss with Febreze and that's yep. it and they charge you five hundred bucks. This <laughs> is going to piss people off, and I guarantee you, if I thought, hey man, I love that Audi new Audi A three, it looks great, I want one. I walk in the dealer and they start talking to me about subscription services. My ass is turning around and walking out. I don't care. I would that I was zero tolerance for that. I know we tolerate it on our phones. We all subscribe for streaming on our TV, but they are I just can't buy it in a car. I just can't do it. I can't do yeah, it. I mean, this this topic keeps rearing its ugly head. It's like they're gonna keep bashing us and sort of nipping away at it. It's almost like you know, it used to be a joke back in the day to say, oh, yeah, you know, he, that guy's so dumb, he pay, he would pay for tap water. And now look at what, what we all do. <laughs> you know, buy bottled tap water. Exactly. exactly. And you know, subscription service, the thing that kind of bugs me, it's a little bit under the surface, is that you're buying a brand new car. That brand new car is depreciating within seconds of leaving the dealership. And yet you are paying a then current retail price for this feature. Uh, they don't even give you the benefit of like, did you, uh, are you buying the car or are you renting the car? You're just buying 94% of the car and you're renting 6% of it. It's just so such a gray area to me that when you go trade it in, are you trading it in with that feature or without that feature? And are they calculating the resale rate with or without? It, 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 it bugs me <laughs> beyond belief to think that I'm still paying a new price for my auto dimming headlights every month or six months or year when I'm not getting it. And mark my words, this is a hacker's delight. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. This is this is the software, you know, Stefan, you've talked about the Teslification of car sales. This is a softwareization of cars. And what's happened is car manufacturers have looked at the ownership situation with cars and they've looked at the train the transition with software. Do you remember back in like 80s and 90s, if you want to get a software, you went to Comp USA or something and you bought a box and then you download it into your computer and now you had the software. Well, yeah. that those days are over. Now you download it online and you pay a you pay a subscription. And in exchange for that, they quote unquote upgraded or updated periodically but you pay by the month now. And of course, software manufacturers are making much more when you pay by the month than when you bought it in a box at Radio Shack. And that's what's happening here. They want to get the monthly payment recurring. And this is a gift that keeps on giving for them. And it's a gift that keeps on taking for us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think for me, the, the biggest thing is they have the hardware in the vehicle. Yeah. And they are now charging you to turn on the electrons to that piece of hardware that's already in the vehicle. And that's what really irritates me. You know, software you take on and off your computer. Yeah, you subscribe, you don't like it, you get rid of it. But if your car has electric seats in it already, they're there. But you got to pay monthly for it. No, I'll pay, I'll pay for the option of the seats. But do I want to pay for electric seats for... 10 years are you freaking kidding me add that up add up all these subscriptions over and owning a car for 10 years so your basis in the car never really stopped you know you yeah. don't have a baseline you did you, you bought it on day one and you're still are paying you can never really adequately guess it's your baseline in the vehicle that you're trading and some of us sort of like to keep up with that i don't and, know and god forbid they roll us into the car loan and people are now paying interest on a seven-year car payment on subscription services, to me, it's just the biggest ripoff. Let's, let's move on before I'm too pissed off at talking the rest of the show. This it's, the ultimate, it's, it's the ultimate to no end. It's the ultimate upsell because you're up. They're already upselling you because the Audi A3 is a Volkswagen Golf. Same yeah. platform, same engine, same transmission. It's got a nicer interior, nicer exterior. Sometimes a nicer dealership, at least as far as the, the upholstery and the couches go. But the, that's the, you upsell. They upsell you to get a Volkswagen Golf called an A3. And now they're going to upsell you again with the software. And let's face it, this is the bottom line. It's the A3 now. Who doubts that in five years it's going to be every single Audi, including the top of the line, Audi A8? Before we move on, Steve, that's a fantastic point. We'll come back to this, I guarantee, because it rubs such a raw nerve, not just with us, but lots of car enthusiasts and just car people, people going into the showroom to buy a car. 
Are you going to be paying uh, less for the Volkswagen option of the same thing and a little bit more for the Audi option of the same thing and a little bit more still for the Porsche option of the same thing? That will be mm. interesting. Probably going to pay, base it on some sort of like core percentage of the total cost of the vehicle as to what your subscription is because they know how much pain you can endure. Personally, I hope it's a major backlash and a big fallout. Yeah, let's move on for uh or we all get crazy see, brain so, fog coming out of steph's ears look you can see yeah it. yeah like brain smoke so um adam's a very 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 influential and a very significant designer in the automotive world just died uh talk about him you know and, and it just just happened there's the man right there marcello gandini uh who worked for bertone uh for I think 14 years he was head of design there. So a lot of the cars that you see with the with the stylized B on them were, were the result of this man. And uh, he was 85 years old and just passed away. And he is posing there with one of his most famous cars, although he designed lots and lots and lots of things besides cars as well. The Lamborghini Mura, which many consider the world's first supercar. And there it is in its profile, just absolutely breathtaking and fantastic a design of 1970. And that was kind of the guy's heyday. I mean, he never quit designing. He was designing to the very end. He built houses and soda machines and all kind of stuff. But he was responsible not just for the glamour cars, but um, the Mark I Volkswagen, Polo, uh, the, the rally dominating Lancia Stratos right there, which has a Ferrari mid-mounted 2.4 liter Dino motor in it. Just look at that little, little thing, that little, little missile. And let's see at whatever else is next on their stuff. We had the, the, the French can also do crazy. There were no R5 turbos. So he designed. I love that car. I do too. You know, and it's, it's not just the turbo, it's the R5. You know, he designed the underpinning of what we would consider a rather mundane pedestrian, but super high volume car. So he could do fantastic job with packaging. He could create very sexy, high performance cars. And uh, he passed away and he is a design legend. He is right up there with Pin and Farina. And he's, he, he's, he's a guy that we're going to miss. He did the, uh, the Lamborghini Countach, uh, the Diablo after that. Um, he did uh, the um, Maserati. Original BMW 5 Series. There you go. Exactly. The original BMW 5 Series, you know, just a you know design landmark there. I didn't know that. Yep. So, so, oh, so, I knew something about BMWs you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally cool. Yeah. Well, you know, the 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 guy could hold a pen. That's for dang sure. He uh he ended up designing uh homes, helicopters, he designed nightclubs. Um, you know, he he was just a guy who understood design. And so R.I.P. Marcello Gandini. All right. Yeah, raise a raise a glass of Chianti to one of the greats. Um, yep. What a portfolio, though. I mean, imagine. I mean, a hundred years from now, when a mural rolls up at Pebble Beach, people it, will say his name. Yes, it's that's the mural to me is of that yep. vintage and sports car. It is the essence of that design. It is just absolutely gorgeous, spectacular. It's timeless. We'll be looking at that, the 911, the Cobra, um, just a totally timeless design that has evolved into other vehicles, and I love the Mira. This yeah. is a breathtaking when you see them in real life. They just, F, I mean, you every mentioned... corner you look at, every angle, it just works. It does work, and you, you mentioned something about the timelessness. I mean, some cars are sort of like fad-like, you know, we, we, we are all attracted to a designer. The Coon Talk, yeah. Yeah, and but the, the 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 so many of the cars that he designed are are not fads. You you look at them ten or twenty or thirty years later and go, my gosh, that is still beautiful today. It's almost like the Grand Master painting. They're never not beautiful. Um, yes. They they don't date themselves. It's yeah. hard. It's it's one of those things in life that's easy to say, hard to do. Uh, Stefan, we've talked about this, but uh, in 1993, uh, I was convinced that. That the new Lexus Coupe, the SC400, yeah, was yeah. And it <laughs> was an amazing design that would stand the test of time. It was an absolute classic. It was it was absolutely beautiful at the time, and I thought absolutely timeless. Well, wrong. It was beautiful at the time, but here we are, thirty years later, yeah. 
it's completely forgotten. And when I see one, I just kind of go, oh, yeah, that's a great exactly. example. I thought the same thing at the, the time as well. The lay down headlights, a smoothly sculpted rear, you know, not too big, not too small. And yeah, it's just a yawner now. Yep, absolutely. Let me see if I can, I'm trying to pull one up here. So if you can, if you can capture, uh, you know, timelessness and really understand what it is, uh, you've done something and, and designers, of course, every single one, that's what they, that's what they shoot for. They always want the timeless design. They want to be remembered for something that in 50 years still looks great. And, uh, and guess what? That, that SC 400 does not look great. So. Yep. All right. Uh, trauma surgeon safety, Stefan, what do you got for us? All right, let's go. Let me, I got a, this is, I've got graphics for this as well. So I want to get this, I want to get this kind of teed up here. Um, there we go. So it was a sad story in, in the press a couple of weeks ago. Um, a lady by the name of Angela Chow, um, a, a billionaire shipping magnate, chief executive of her family's uh, global shipping operation, drowned in her 2020 Tesla Model X. And during uh, COVID, they left their home up in New York, and I'm pretty sure it was New York, and they moved to Austin, Texas, a large ranch. And she was having um, several of her girlfriends um, from the Harvard Business School come spend the holiday weekend of February 9th. And on her property, she has a little 10 bedroom guest house known as the inn. And I've got the picture here that you can see. This is the compound. And if you look at the picture at the top, you can see some silver buildings and there's a pond behind that. So she was in the parking lot there. And she left about 1130 at night. She has a three year old son who was asleep in the main house under the care of the nanny. And she had previously had problems with her tesla model x that has this has a little column shift where you go up and down to put it in and out of gear and she'd previously had problems about it people would complain about this all the mercedes has the same type shifter in some of their earlier mercedes so this is not an uncommon type shifter and then they also have it where you can change the gears on the touch screen i couldn't we really don't know whether she's using the touch screen or the shifter on the column but she was basically trying to do a three point turn to get out of there and revert was in reverse. And apparently, you know, just hit the gas and went straight into the pond. And she was actually calling her friends while she was in the vehicle. And she was in a complete panic and she couldn't get out of the car. Um, and, um, it sank fast. They tried to help her. And over the next several hours, people tried to get, break the windows to get the car open one person was afraid to get in the water because they were afraid they may get electrocuted. Paramedics came and then they were afraid to hook the car to pull it out because they may puncture the battery. And um, it was it's just a very, very sad case. But it brings up the it brings up the topic of what should you do if your vehicle crashes into the water? And um, so if you think about the timing of this, cars do float. But you've got about a minute before the car actually sinks. So cars are well sealed today in the interior compartments of windows, the doors. So when they hit the water, they're going to go, front engine cars are going to go nose down first, a little bit angled down, and the car is going to fill up and slowly water will, will infiltrate the cabin. And you got to think about it. Let's say best case scenario now, your airbags are not deployed. Because let's say you crash and you hit the water hard enough, or you hit something, your airbags deployed, you're going to be stunned by the airbags, which is probably going to take away your minute of opportunity. You know, but, and if you've got a bridge, honestly, you know, you really, if you fly off a bridge, you don't have a chance, of course, unless you're a Kennedy. But, you know, the old cars, Ooh. oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Do that again. I, I, but, you know, the older cars, think about if you go into the water, you crank the windows down. New cars, are all electric windows and typically an impact like this there's going to be some shortage the switches are going to go out the switches are wet they're not going to work but what happens in a car when it's sinking is there's a massive amount of pressure from the surrounding water and uh you know it's 32 feet it's one atmosphere but what happens is when you go into the water with your windows up the pressure from the water is so great that you cannot open the doors to get out the only time you can open the door is when the pressure inside of the car is equal to the pressure outside. 
by that time, think about it. If you're in deep water, you're going to be down deep. Okay. And you're going to have to swim to the top. It's, it's not going to happen if you're pretty much below five feet of water. You're just not going to get out. And what about breaking the glass? Well, most new cars, one out of three, actually have laminated glass on the side windows. This helps in side impact protection. It makes cars quieter. A lot of safety qualities. But the problem is with this laminated glass, we've all seen the emergency hammer that they show on TV to cut your seatbelt. You can't break laminated glass with a hammer. Okay, you can't do it. And you can't do it inside when you've got water around your arm and you're trying to move the glass. That's not going to happen. So the only thing that really works are the spring-loaded escape tools. And they work some of the time, but not all the time. So they found that even with the laminated glass, the spring-loaded tools would not break the glass, that it would only work on tempered glass. So really, you know, the idea of breaking the glass to get out is that's not going to happen. So unfortunately, this does happen, and we have about 350 to 400 people that are what are called submersion-related fatalities a year. So this is a real entity. So they, they come up with an acronym of how to think about it to get out. And this is, you know, we love an acronyms, and, but in, in the moment of panic, it's the last thing you're going to remember. You know, if you work in the workplace, they've got fire this and fire that. And, but it's a sure way to get out. So an S stands for stay calm. Well, that's, you know, it, that's why we train in the military in all kinds of situations, bad situations. We do disaster exercises because it is hard to stay calm in the face of calamity. And But time is of essence. The car may float 30 seconds. And really, if you're not out within one minute, you're not getting out. It does not happen. 30 seconds is about the max time you got. You've got to unbuckle the seat belts that you have on. You can imagine if your airbag is deployed or you got kids in the back, you're going to be worried about them, not yourself. Next is roll down the window. And um, I would almost be tentative if, you know, I, to roll down the window first. But, you know, it, the sure way to get out gets out. But um, hit that down button. And hopefully your car might have a um, automatic down. But if you've been in a pretty severe wreck and you're rolling off the road and you've had door damage, your window is not going to go down, unfortunately. You may not get that door open. But the idea is you roll down the window, you get your, have your seatbelt off, and the minute the water stops, stops rushing in through the window, you can then get out through your window. Um, that's the idea. When I was in the military, when I went to flight training school as a flight surgeon, they actually put us in a helicopter cockpit with the full four point restraints, we had the helmet with a blackout. And then they dunk this into a 10 foot pool and it goes down at the bottom and you're upside down and you have to self extricate from the bottom. And um, I'm very comfortable in the water. It's, it still is a herring experience to get out of the helicopter, completely blind in the dark, upside down in the water. Um, they had divers in the water. They don't do that anymore because they, a lot of people freaked out and there were some injuries. Um, but I've done that before. It is very hard to get out of something underwater. Um, the hammers are really not going to help you. And then exit the vehicle. You know, and then uh, our fate, one of my favorite shows, Mythbusters, wanted to see about it, you know, really what happens here. So in, in classic Mythbusters episode, Adam Savage is sitting in a the car. They took the engine out. They put in a 700-pound weight in the front. They put the car up on chains, and they let the car into a swimming pool. And I can't remember the other guy that was on the show, Adam and the other the other guy. The other guy's in the back seat with a um, scuba respirator and has a respirator for Adam. And the car, they drop the car into the water. It starts going out. And by the time that Adam could get the door open, even after he had let the water in, he was completely out of breath. And he, he couldn't get out. He ran out of breath during this time. You think about it, you, you know, you're panic breathing. And then when you actually have to hold your breath, You've been panic breathing for so long, the stress of a car wreck, you're not going to be able to hold your breath like you do in the swimming pool for a minute, minute and a half, three minutes if you practice. So he couldn't get out of the car. And this is under a controlled situation. And he was able so, to prepare. And he was prepared. He knew it was coming and hit, but he still couldn't do it. So I go visit a friend of mine where I go hunting and it, there's this, you, you cross this place, you come down the hill through the trees and you hit the bottom. And the roadway is in between two very large ponds. I call them baby little lakes. 
that are about four feet below the road surface, about six feet off the shoulder. And every time I go through there, it's like, I'm holding my breath. It's like, I'm not, cause I'm like freaking out that, you know, don't run off the road. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bad thing. It's happened. We've seen it in Birmingham. We've had one of the, I've seen this before, heard about it, you know, um, but unfortunately it's, it's something that it's going to be, if you're not prepared and you don't act within quickly within 30 seconds, unfortunately, you're not going to survive. And I think honestly, the idea of you getting out and then getting your children out of the back seat or your passengers, in the back seat is, is not going to happen. It'll it's be, points always that you know people just don't even consider because you're describing something that people like in their worst nightmare don't want to have to consider although preparation's key yeah but would uh, an airbag deployment uh aid in the buoyancy at all would it give you a slightly longer margin to escape now they rapidly deflate because the idea of the airbag is that the airbag inflates and the and the concept is is that when you strike the airbag the airbag airbag deflates with you to help you decelerate to slows your deceleration so if the airbag were to fill up and stay filled up you'd bounce off it like a balloon and you'd be injured but that is you actually hit the airbag and then it deflates rapidly they have vents on the back side okay is there any information i don't want to put you on the spot on having to look something up is there any information on the sink rate i'm sure there's a fancier term for evs versus um, ice vehicles just because of how heavy they are I would have to imagine the mass, you know, you take, you take a vehicle the same size and, you know, the reason, you know, cruise ships and Navy ships float, things float is that they actually weigh less than the water they displace. Okay. So it's all up. So whether or not something floats is purely dependent upon its weight mm -hmm. and it has to weigh less than the water it displaces. So a, if you take a, a Honda Accord EV, and a regular Honda Accord, the regular Honda Accord is going to weigh probably 2,000 pounds more in the same amount of displacement of water based on size. It's going to sink like a rock. Mm -hmm. And the EV is going to sink like a rock. It's an, you probably have well, you know, had, on the show, he had about a minute. I didn't time it, but it was right around a minute, it may be a little bit longer. But an EV, I think, is going to go down pretty fast. And, I, you know, just because of the mere, the mere amount of weight. Well, people sure did sell a whole lot of those uh, safety hammers to get you out of that trouble for what apparently sounds like a lost cause. The hammers are a lost cause. If you have tempered glass and you've got the one that pops, you're more like, you know, likely to use it. But think about it. You're inside a car, a car, and you're trying to swing and hit the glass to the, your left of you, right by your head and face. I mean, and it's a sideways swing. So it's not where you're able to use your triceps in full extension. You're sitting in a car and you're swinging to your left. Those are not our strongest muscles to use. So those uh, those hammers uh, are used. Uh, they're bought uh, probably zero point zero one percent of people who buy them buy them to get out of a sinking car. The rest of the people who buy them buy them to break into cars in San Francisco to steal their contents. Um, <laughs> Let's well, go ahead and, right. and move on. By the way, that was a, I'm going to say this, uh, Adams, you like segues. Uh, that was a freak uh, death and very, very sad. Uh, Adams, you had a freak car sighting that was also sad. It was. And this is a car whose sales <laughs> sank like that. I hope you like that one. All right. Yeah, that is very good. Let me, I, I got to <laughs> find it here. <laughs> Well, I guess you would start talking about it while he's bringing up the picture. Yeah, I got to bring it. Start talking about it and give me a second. I thought I had the picture here. All right. In the late 80s, you know, uh, GM w w was not known to be on a roll, as they say. And, you know, you, you look at this car that we're going to show in a second. And this is a car that was sort of a, it's not an unattractive car. But when I saw it, I thought, man, I hadn't seen one of those in a long time. And we we're getting a close up of your abdominals here no oh geez sorry i got i got my regular camera's not working here we go okay i got it now <laughs> there we go are oh, the know. riata they were trying to be all european with it it was sort of like in the same uh design committee meeting as the alante and the riata is not an unattractive car so i, I don't want to bash it you know too too bad uh designed by uh gm's dave mcintosh and this is a car that was released, oh, in 88. 
and it, it lasted until 91. And you're seeing it here actually next to an Elante. I didn't even realize that right in the right. back. And that's a Pinaforina design on the uh, the Elante. Now, he would never take credit or discredit for the Elante because Cadillac changed it so much. But this is a front-wheel drive, 3.8-liter V6 turns tra turned transverse, basically the, the, the underpinning motor of Buick's otherwise wonderful car, the Buick Grand National and the GNX. But the Riata was to be their flagship sort of standard bearer, you know, uh, halo car, as they called them. And again, not unattractive, but the Riviera was already not. This is what I can't understand. The Riviera was already not selling as a two-door coupe. So they come out with this, you know, great expense, another two-door coupe. They had design uh, uh, hopes that, they, that this car would sell 20,000 units a year. In four model years, it sold 21,000 total. Oh, wow. Hurtful, hurtful. And, you know, Steph, there's probably one or two more pictures of it, not a whole, whole lot. You know, I mean, it's it, again, you look at it and go, that's not bad. Kind of European, sort of sexy, a little bit cab forward. This is an interior design that will not win any awards uh, as we are. This is our interiors episode. And this was a super early touch screen that right there where the cursor is is a touch screen and it was terrible absolutely low low tech no tech and uh that dash you know just the digital dash and all that but it was interesting to see it and before we move on i'll just say this is like gm all in hindsight you know people don't know it at the time but they seem so desperate they're doing the riata the elante the ssr the hhr the Saturn, the Hummer, you know, they're, the the Fiero, which I give a buy because I'm the only person in America who loves sports cars and still likes the Fiero. Yes, I said it. Uh, but they had all these experimental sort of, can we create a spark here? And once again, this Riata just didn't do it. They built a car for a niche that did not exist. There you go. That's ex they sure... Yeah. I yeah. think that I think that there was here's the problem. There was a niche for Mercedes, uh, and there was a niche for BMW with their six series, uh, but there was not a niche for uh, GM. Ford actually did okay with their, you know, the Thunderbird and you know the the Mark, the Lincoln Mark Seven that we talked about. They did okay too. They sold a lot more, but they were people really wanted quality, and they, if you're going to pay up. People were willing to pay an arm and a leg for Mercedes SL, and they were willing to pay a lot for a BMW 6 Series because you sat in it, it felt special, it felt nice. Plastics were good, really good quality. It was a really good vehicle. This was trash. It looks like a like an old Camaro with yeah. those cheap plastics and rattles galore. Rattles galore, exactly. You know, as as we and we're we're about to have another wonderful segue because it's the experience. You know, once you get over, hey, that's an attractive car. You actually have to go sit in the thing to drive it around. And you're right. The whole aural experience was terrible. Wind leaks and rattles and all kind of stuff you couldn't even get to and crappy looking dashboards. But that was a, a sad chapter in GM history. Uh, one quick uh, thing that will also take us to talk about interiors. Uh, first touchscreen, I think in, a, in any car, certainly in an American car, it had a touchscreen. Uh, but it was 80s GM, so it was a crappy touchscreen. Indeed it was. But I thought it was good. I remember at the time, I thought it was great, but then I looked at the interior. Uh, I never liked it. I just thought, I, I didn't understand what it was supposed to be. It just it just had zero appeal to me. I just hated it when it came out. Well, it wasn't it. that different. And again, this is, a car came out in the same year. It wasn't that different from the Acura Legend Coupe, which was about the same size, also front-wheel drive, also V6. But the back seat of these things was much, much smaller. No, you not much. So? You should, the Acura, Acura Legend Coupe had a tiny back seat. And it, it, it was, it, honestly, I bet they were similar in, in, in back seat size. The Acura Legend back seat was just not good. But the interior was nice, and it just wasn't NGM. I agree. And the last thing on the Acura Coupe, I remember when that car came out, when it was the Legend back in the day, before they, they went on into the, the, the letters and such. But the Legend Coupe, 
look to me in profile like the BMW 3.0 CS, which is one of the prettiest coupes ever pinned. Yeah, that was absolutely gorgeous. All right. Well, um, I think it was last, it was last week. We started talking about, uh, we did a, um, a car spotting on the Ineos Grenadier. And one thing that stood out was the interior because unlike, for example, the new Volkswagen Golf, where it's all touchscreen, there are almost no buttons. This, and there it is, Stefan, lots and lots of buttons in the Ineos Grenadier. And we started talking about the safety benefits of that. And Stefan, um, go into that more because we there's more to talk about here. Safety, buttons, touchscreen, distraction. Yeah, we talked about it, um, you know, in... I did a segment on things that distract people in cars, and one of them is is touch screens. You can imagine, and the, and we mentioned the Tesla Model X earlier. Tesla has now changed it where there is no shifter on the car. You actually put it into forward or reverse by using a slider on the touch screen, or some of them will still have buttons on the steering wheel on or up on the panel. You can hit park, reverse, or drive. Um, and I think. To me, this is kind of like the same thing as the volume button. Everybody knows how to turn a st the noise up or down by rotating a knob. Okay, we all know that's something that's just inherent to what we do. We've learned. And when manufacturers come in with new interfaces in which you do behaviors that you're used to having done, it creates a lot of you know discontinuity in your brain. Your brain misfires. What the hell? I then you're distracted because now you're going through touch screens. And then we were talking about that. And we mentioned the Grenadier is one of a car spotting. And this thing has more buttons on it than I've ever seen. And in, in probably a or late, what year did Porsche come out with like 40 buttons running up the, uh, between the, the right seat and the, the, between the two front seats. What year was that? That 928 or. 928. Um, that, yeah. 928. I mean, literally there were like 40 buttons, tiny things, but so yep. here's the Grenadier. And it has, you know, lots of buttons, kind of aircraft, military style, you know, but this is the kind of thing that you are going to learn these buttons quickly. Um, buttons are something that we interface with all the time. You turn dials on your stove, you punch buttons on your washing machines, your dishwashers, you know, we've got keypads with buttons on them. And it's just something that's easier to use and this trend of moving everything to a you know, touch screen interface where you've got to drive through windows. We've talked about it. It is bad for driver distraction and, and things happen. You can blindly change the volume on a car stereo that's got a knob. You can't do it if it's got a touch screen. You can't do it blindly. You have to look at the thing. So we talked about that. And then, um, so I, I like this. I mean, I find this interior industrial cool, kind of like an airplane. And this is the the opposite extreme, taking it back the other way. But I do like the idea that I think there are certain knobs and certain ways that we interface with the vehicle that need to remain so that the driver can be focused and not distracted on where to find the button. And just think about it, every time you get in a rental car, how much time do you figure out trying to spend to set the, the, the HVAC to your temperature that you want, the seat to what you want, and um, I so I, I think that we there are certain basic ways that we the human interfaces with the vehicle that that need to just kind of remain standard. I agree, Steph. I think some some of this ought to be just like an inviolable design standard. I mean, we all know that the steering wheel is on the driver's side and it's right in front of us, and the horn button is somewhere within that circumference, and the blinker is on the left, and the wipers are generally on the right. Uh, we know that the brake pedal should be in or about the middle and the gas pedal is to the right of that. And just because a designer can get away with like putting the gas pedal on the left because it looks cool, it's it's just not practical. It, it doesn't serve any real purpose other than saying you can do it. And just being able to do it does not mean that you should do it. Mm -hmm. I love this interior. I don't know if that's where you were going with it, but I'd, I could be very comfortable in that car kind of learning a little bit about where the buttons are. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them, but I would rather have that interface than a touch screen any day. Well, Adams, yeah. I know you're going to talk about collectability. I, I agree with Stefan. This is a beautiful interior, and I do think it's safer. I, I, I mean, I, I can imagine you could figure out where the major buttons are, and, and you would never 
you know, you never take your your eyes off the road to change the volume or the temperature. Uh, it would be easy to do. I think interiors are hugely undervalued. Uh, I'll give you an example of why. And I think, you know, in every day we think about it because, you know, you get in your car, you like it or you don't. And the interior is where you spend most of the time. You don't spend that much time looking at the exterior. But think of Audi. In the 1970s, Audi was nothing. I used to, it's like Opal. They were they were nobody. They were nothing special. They certainly were not considered a mainstream luxury brand. And then they came out with Quattro and then rallying and racing. And that raised their visibility and raised their credibility. But it was not until the 90s when the A4 came out. And that was the first Audi that said, we're going to have best interiors, best in-class interior. And the A4 was designed to compete with the BMW 3 Series, but it had a better, much nicer interior. Specifically, it had beautiful, very legible dials, black background, white numbers, red needles. And BMW always had kind of similar, but no red needles, white needles, and kind of an orangish kind of hue. Now, BMWs have black back, white knob, white, white numbers, and red needles. Audis back in the 90s, became best in class interior seats dashboard quality and that is what made them equal to Lexus BMW Mercedes where they are now nice interiors in the 90s is what changed it man i think you just nailed it yeah that's exactly the the way i recall it i was at i worked at an Audi Porsche Volvo Nissan dealership in the time that the Audi came out and it was so unusual just to 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 sit in a in a four thousand or a five thousand or the quattro and go, my gosh, it, we didn't even know what that word ergonomics meant. I mean, that that was like a new word in interior design, and Audi just killed it. All the switch gear felt good. You could close your eyes in what we now call haptics, uh, the interface and the clicking and the little detente that a small little ball bearing would would rotate when you would adjust even the wiper speed. And it all felt good, and it was all readily to hand. Audi just really set the bar for everyone else to try to follow. When well, yeah, but to, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. When it comes to collectability, Adams, if you took a really nice interior, let's say one that's similar to an Audi, and you stuck that into the Buick Riata, I think it would be much more collectible now. I think you're exactly right because I think we just saw what it looked like, and those, you know, it's it's kind of funny to say, oh cheap plastics versus really good plastics. Well, there really are good plastics, but the one that we showed earlier in the Riata, sadly, and again, no fault of the designer because it was all built at a cost. Uh, it was very cheap. It was very tinny and it, and it was prone to breaking and it creaked when it was hot in the sun or cold in the winter. And yeah, I agree with you. And go ahead, Steph. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Why, well, you know, if it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But, you know, I beat on the 4Runner all the time. Well, here's a 2010 4Runner interior. Okay, here's 2024. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. <laughs> it's the same. There they are, top and bottom. Okay, but so that is that's a, that's a good <laughs> functional interior. But here's the problem I have with the 4Runner, okay? And I'm going to switch screens here. I mean, One of many problems. One of many problems. But here I'm going to share the screen. Okay, not only have they not changed the dash, okay, they have not done a whole lot to advance the safety of this vehicle. So when you go to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety here and you pull up the 2024 Toyota 4 Runner, it's it's not good ratings. But here's what's really you scroll down here. Rating applies to 2014 to 2024 models because they ain't done a damn thing for the safety of that car in 10 years. Okay. 10 so, years. It's incredible. Yeah. It's basically the same vehicle. They need, they need an update, you know? So yeah. All right. There you go. That's enough on that. Let's move on. Well, hey, I before, never get this sheet. Is that unusual to see one that has been around that long that, that the rating would apply to a 10 year run? Is that super unusual? I, I have not seen, I was like, I was mortified when I saw that. I imagine you know, um, I know the Ford trucks have undergone some innovation. I don't know of any other one that I think they it's have. that. It's the fun. I think it's that and the Tacoma. Yes, it has to be the Tacoma exactly because they're the same vehicle. So I was, I saw, I saw that, and I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" Rating applies for the cars for the last ten years. 
Oh, well, we're gonna word. we're gonna pick our favorite interiors, but before we do, uh, Stefan, I know you, you were blown away the first time you saw this car, and I would say when this car came out and blew everybody's mind, people tend to forget that one of the things that blew people's mind, in addition to the price, in addition to the quality, and I'm talking 1990 Lexus LS 400, was the electroluminescent gauges. They were so, so cool. cool, and they looked they looked quality and space age and it helped give that car all the oomph and everything that it had yep it all did right, well i i challenged uh by the way uh, adams do you think i think i think the ls 400 will be collectible someday yeah, well i actually said a few episodes back that i thought we'd see one on on a uh, pebble beach lawn and uh i, I thought you were going to cancel me as a, as a guest <laughs> I, I i'm not going to disagree with that i i can't imagine i did at the time you uh, well I, you know i feel like that that car was a landmark and it fits uh into what what collectors consider that they're like seven seven primary parameters of what makes a car collectible and these can be debated and they're all like in degrees but it's rarity exterior design uh performance relative to the era engineering breakthrough, racing accolades, or any other accolades you can attach to it, driving dynamics, and, of course, interior design. And I feel like accepting a couple of those things that Lexus LS400 of 1990 would make it. And we look at interior design, and like Steve said, you spend so much time on the interior of your car, and a lot of these cars uh, that we're going to take a look at uh, have wonderful exterior designs. They may have some of these other uh, benefits within them, but the interiors have changed. The, the uh, various uh, countries have a certain design style and language that goes with it. And the first one we're going to take a look at is um, so, some of the what might be considered outlandish or gaudy designs of the the, uh, the American cars of the fifties through the seventies. Uh, and Steph, if you want to pull up the um, yeah, here it is. The, the the Cadillac. Wow. Uh, I mean, j j just look at that. I mean, that, that's so they, like, yeah. Tell tell listeners what you're looking at here, Adam. 1959 Cadillac Eldorado Biarritz, and uh, once again, sort of like trying to be a little bit European, but you know, it's got lots of chrome and lots of decoration, um, lots of switch gear. You know, design elements that go from the seats to the door panels, up to the dash, and you've got that <laughs> you've got that crazy looking. What do they call that thing in the middle of the dash? The Sentinel Eye which um, would dim your lights for oncoming vehicles. You've got the horizontal designs. I'm sort of like lauding back to the, the, the rectolinear designs of architecture of the era. You've, everything's horizontal looking. Everything's like cool and sleek. And I don't think our safety expert would approve of one surface in that interior on the dashboard. <laughs> it's gorgeous, though. I love that interior. That's just like... That just is peak American design there, and it's beautiful, absolutely gorgeous yes. interior. And in stark contrast, as we get on into our favorite interiors, you see the austerity of basically the same exact era Porsche 356. And Which works as well. It, it, it totally it works. It, yeah, it works in a different way. Yep. In a German way. You know, the other you expect the American, and this is a German, and they're both absolutely gorgeous interiors. They are, and I appreciate you saying that because they, they're gorgeous in their own way for the purpose that, for which they were designed. And that, I don't think that's an original steering wheel. That looks like a nardy steering wheel. But aside from that, you've got the three main gauge cluster. Porsche later went to five, but you've got the central mounted tack. And if you click the next one, you'll see, you know, 15 years later, that's what a 911 looks like now with the five gauges. But a lot of similarities there. And we referenced earlier in this show about the 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 long lasting great designs you know they don't go out they keep evolving and changing and evolving and changing and then we've got a different um, uh, design approach uh, coming up with the absolute most luxurious interior of that is a Rolls Royce I'm sure a Bentley of the era uh, 1965 uh, Ghost and you see all the incredible walnut wood and if you were looking closer you would see that it was matched uh, in the middle. It was, you know, what 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 a designer, you can laugh at this, but it's like crotch matched 
Yep, make your own joke there, crotch matched wood on the middle of the, the uh, dashboard. It would be the same as it is on, 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 on the left as it is on the right. You have fold out picnic tables with these wonderful little chrome pieces that held the picnic table up. And it's sort of this would you care to stay for tea atmosphere. And you can just glance around that interior. It's honestly, it's like being in in the library of someone's home as opposed to an automobile. And then the next one, you'll see uh, what the British can also do, which is this was taken. This is the the E type of 1961. You can tell that's an early series one because of all the the metal in the middle. And this was an attempt to mimic aircraft. And it's got wonderful row of toggle switches. And if you could zoom in, I'm not asking you to zoom in, but if a person were familiar with the E type, they would know those aren't even labeled. You actually have to learn. And, you know, there's a little bit of white writing on there that wore off in the first couple of years that would say it was for lights or wipers or heater fan or whatever it was. But it was very aircraft oriented and you had to kind of get familiar with it to understand it. And only two gauges there on the left and the middle, that uh, metal uh, aluminum piece would actually fold down so you could get to all those gauges. And next we'll see another interior design the flamboyance of the Italians. Uh, you can look at that car. You don't even, if you did not see that prancing horse, the Cavallino in the middle of the steering wheel, you would know that is an Italian car. It's just got stylistic elements galore. Somebody loved drawing it. And this is a Fioravanti design, but I don't need, I don't even know if the interior design is credited because as Steve said, sometimes it's overlooked. It's got a, if you look in the middle of that, that console, Interesting that the shift gate is not visible in that, but if you look at the center console, you'll see that that radio. That is a Becker Europa radio, and no, it's not just turned sideways. The Italians were so into design, they got Becker to design that vertically. So the writing on that oh, radio wow. is Oh, turned. that's cool. Yeah, it is cool. It's turned 90 degrees, and it's only on that car, on a um, uh, De Tomaso Pantera, and on... You can't believe it. The Chevrolet Corsica, the uh, other car that would have a vertical mm. radio, but that radio is probably worth seven or eight thousand dollars just because it's so unusual. But anyway, so there's another interior design. It's got the what they used to call mouse fur, which we would now call uh, Alcantara or suede on the dash to keep the reflections down. Lots of attention paid to this. Uh, and next we have what I would consider, and maybe y'all don't agree here uh pinnacle of modern era design the the uh, mclaren f1 with the uh, the center driver three seats i'd have to agree Act that crazy. was just a crazy interior at the time make your comments about that because gordon mm -hmm. Murray was on to something with that well yeah, it's early too. it's early 90s this is still unique uh it's got a center seat so the driver sits in the center and there's a passenger over his left shoulder behind him, and there's a passenger over his right shoulder behind him. So he's three people sit across, uh, and, this, and the driver's in the center. I just love it. I just think that that is like a, a peak, peak, peak design. And I think that's a large degree. Like Steve was saying, hey, if the, the Riata had, you know, a, a, a way better interior, would it be worth more? I actually think it would be, because I think a lot of times people mention the, the F1 McLaren. Yeah, it performs great. Yeah, it looks great. And there's a photo of its exterior uh, below that but it's the interior people go oh my lord look at that cockpit so yeah we will all now take a look at the interior designs that we like that we're attracted to uh pluses or minuses reasons we like them and reasons that we don't yeah i thought it was a good idea for us to pick our favorite uh i loved you know adams i love the way you ran through the eras because uh the change from the 61 E type to the 72 uh, Daytona Ferrari, then the 911s, and then of course the 1992 McLaren F1. Stefan, I think you'd be impressed. 1972 Ferrari Daytona, uh, they took safety into consideration. You didn't have to take your eyes off the road to put out your cigarette and the ashtray right in the center between the two seats, right? It's, it's like you can't miss it. It's right in the center. It's a huge ashtray. <clears throat> That's funny. All right. So we're thinking safety when they did that. Yeah. Uh, let me go first because um, 
I kind of want to leave uh, Adams for last because I know it's going to be yep. great. I, my my interior was different, and I just said I'm going to pick this because it's old and new, and I picked the 2020 Bugatti Chiron. Now, uh, I, it's not a paragon of accessibility since it's priced to start at around three million dollars, <laughs> but <laughs> but th- what I liked about it is this is a car. It's destined. It's specifically designed to be timeless. The zeitgeist of 2020 is screens everywhere, and Bugatti said, "No, we're not going to have any screens. It's a 2020 car. No screens. Has buttons, dashes, which are analog, not analog, but it's, it looks analog." Steph, can and you make buttons? Because that is and, being large, and, and it's 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 got a nice steering with a couple buttons on it. But this is something where you could not be distracted. It deliberately makes its its simplicity, and it's beautiful. And this is timeless. If it had lots of a big touchscreen, or if it was a touchscreen, any any kind of touchscreen, it would not be timeless. But this, Stefan, what you were talking about, hey, how about buttons? And it has buttons just like the 1961 Jaguar E Type. This is very very less is more. I it's my favorite interior of all time for for that reason. That's a fantastic pick. You know, I'm telling you. I- I've seen about two Bugattis from the exterior before at all the shows I've been at. This makes me want to just go sit in one. Yeah. That's gorgeous. Yeah. It's like they designed this knowing that in a hundred or 200 years, this car was going to be at a car show, Pebble Beach, whatever it is. And it's going to look great in a hundred years. Agreed. That's not Agreed. a lot of buttons in a car like that with everything. It's a, a, a surprising. Yeah. All right. Stefan, what's yours? All right. So uh, let's see. My my favorite car interior, I think, would have to be the uh, the Nissan oh. Cube with the uh, $300 <laughs> shag carpet option. Yeah. <laughs> is that flare hair? What is that? Living up. <laughs> That's a, this is a joke. This, but you, that actually, that was a $300 option on the Nissan Cube. And I don't know if it's, it's your traveling portable kit cat litter box i don't know exactly but i guess you can put stuff up there so it doesn't fly around but yeah that was a 300 hundred dollar option the nissan cube anyway um i think if you've heard me on this show before listeners you know i'm very partial to the bentley especially mm. the supercontinental sports this is the bentley um this is 2021 um bentley mulsanne and um they have won multiple awards for interiors but here i'm just going to Ooh. So this is, you know, the Adam showed a picture of the Rolls Royce, which is to me almost overstated opulence. This is the Bentley interior in my mind is a just is right at the edge of being too much opulence. But I've had the good fortune to sit in several Bentleys and see them up close. And when you get in a Bentley interior, First of all, you know the car is going to drive well. It's going to haul ass. It's going to have power. But then at the same time, you are just coddled in this luxuriousness of quilted leather, of textures with wood versus laminates, and then jeweled um, instruments. And the car, in my mind, is just spectacular. Front, rear, um, and here's a picture of of the gauges up front. Just I mean, yep. little Swiss chronometers, jeweled instruments. You you don't mean actual jewels. You mean some sort of like faceting to the metal. Is that what that means? Faceting to the metal, and it looks like a watch. Basically, oh, it's that, jeweled that. like a watch, where you know it it looks like a fine Swiss piece. Um, and and it really does. Know, yeah. And it's just I so for me this is, you know, a, a Bentley is always my aspiration car. Um, it'd be the two door Continental, but. The, the, the interiors of the two-door Continentals are nice, but this 2021 interior to me is just peak Bentley modern elegance in the materials and the switch gear are just, just fantastic. I love it. It's beautiful. All right. No. Uh, uh, Adams, go ahead. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's a great a great choice. That is a great choice. Well, oh, I'm glad you like the Nissan Cube. It was a good choice. <laughs> I still want to know what that black artificial turf on the tank is. My mind's reeling. Okay, I chose the uh, the the Spiker Laviolette, uh, and, and there, of course, it's it's incredibly exterior design. 
and they were they were going back to the the era where where the Dutch had an aircraft company called Spiker, and then they made an automobile company uh, that is still sort of like uh, being built. Uh, hard to say; it's very much um, a custom order. But the interior of this car was just a whole different level of approach to automobiles. And they used, you know, a lot of the diamond quilting that we've seen in the the uh, other examples of both both of us tend to like the, the, the diamond quilting. It can be overdone. And this one might be an example of that. But at the time that it came out, it was pretty unusual. Uh, it's got an engine turned dash and fantastic, very mechanical looking. Everything about it looks mechanical. Uh, the the there's your your dashboard right there. Ooh. Engine, just means that they, they like a Dremel type piece hits the the dash and flourishes it to attempt to direct some of the reflection downward away from your eyes. Although it's very glitzy in its own way, and I love the fact that they chose off white gauges. I don't you know how the designer got away with that is like they let somebody have at it, and you'll see those. Um, the, the restrainers in between the toggle switches uh, to keep you from accidentally hitting one, like when you mean the third one, but you hit the second one. Well, those restrainers uh, keep you from doing that. That red button at the upper left is the main fuel on switch, ignition on switch to, to, to give power to the car. And if you go back up one, Steph, and I won't dwell on it too, too long, but just look at I wanna, that. I want to try to blow that shifter up. The shifter is suspended okay. and its shift mechanism is part of the interior. So you're actually moving rods that you can see, not just a lever, but you're moving that shift rod, which I think is just right here. Ultra cool. So that's like my favorite part of the interior. That is a right. crazy interior. I mean, it's, um, I, I admire it and I love everything technical, every piece of metal in there. But for me, it, it is that is uh, over engineering sensory overload. It's like, um, it's, I, it's, it's just the way I like it. I, I mean, I, I think it is one of the coolest interiors, but I would, it would just make me almost dizzy all the time with the, the, the buttons and, the, and everything in this car because there's every piece is so shiny, polished. But I bet the tactile feel of driving this car is just second to none. You reach over, you flip one of those toggles, you're going to get a nice click. And you're going to feel a solid mechanical linkage, and um, yeah, it would be a it be it would be an amazing. But boy, it's 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 an impressive interior. I I uh, I do like it. If you zoom out a little bit, just you know, don't zoom in, zoom out. Yeah. Uh, my take on that is go ahead and show it again. My yeah. take on that is they 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 probably spent two years on this, and the designers were working like crazy for two years, and then uh, they had twenty four hours to go, and then someone said, "Oh crap, we yes. forgot the st we forgot the steering wheel, so <laughs> let's just take any steering wheel and stick it in there." So they found this like at the at the auto store, <laughs> and they stuck the steering wheel. It doesn't it doesn't match. It doesn't go. You're right. Even even the color doesn't really match. It's You're just like they're like, oh crap, we gotta, we need, we forgot the steering wheel, and then they stuck this in. It's it it, it was the, it was the desi the same exact uh, design meeting as Pantera had. <laughs> they went, oh my god, now what? Oh, <laughs> stick this this Capri steering wheel in there, and I agree with you. Yeah, that is that is way under designed, and probably if you pulled that Spiker uh, logo out of the middle, you would see the word Grant. <laughs> They they yeah. had to borrow that from somebody to because of the airbag. Um, right. It looks like they, yeah. they couldn't afford to develop their own steering wheel with because of the airbag. So that is a that is a borrowed steering wheel shelf. from somebody off the shelf steering wheel. Yeah. Use safety killjoys once again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we were out of time, but what a great show. This was the interior show, as you <laughs> dubbed it, Adams, and uh lots and lots of fun. Interiors are underrated, underappreciated, except by the geniuses at Cars on Call. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Close this out, Stefan. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And uh, when you cross that body of water on your left and right, just think about it. How do you exit your vehicle? I know I do because I've just seen too much in my life. But uh, thanks for listening. And if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for that. Hit the bell. 
Remember, like, subscribe, tell your friends, leave comments, and see you guys next week.